Hello and you're a very good morning. You're welcome to today's Signpost webinar. My name is Mark Gibson and uh, today we're going to be celebrating National Biodiversity Week with a, report, uh, a presentation from the chair of the Citizens Assembly on Biodiversity Lost, uh, Dr. Evie Nihuluan, who is an associate professor in the School of Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, Evie, you're very welcome to Thanks the very webinar. Much, Mark. And Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No, it's great. It's it's great to have you on the on the webinar. And uh, good morning to Catherine Keena, uh, who's going to help us uh, uh, with the questions after Evie's presentation. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning. Hi, Catherine. So, Evie, the the report on the Citizens Assembly uh, it was launched last month and contains 159 recommendations that have the potential. Uh, to dramatically transform Ireland's relationship with the natural environment. This has been a, a, a pretty mammoth task to, to distill the views of the country uh, into one report, if it's fair to describe it like that. Um, I don't know if you can say it's the views of the country, but it's certainly the views of these members of the Citizens' Assembly um, who, you know, did a tremendous civic duty in giving up all of their time to participate in this work. Um, so I'm very happy to talk through it now um, and have a presentation um, just on the process of this assembly and yeah. the recommendations, some of them. We won't go through all the 159 and then we'll have plenty of time for questions after that, Mark, if, if I should start the presentation. Yeah, that, that's perfect, Eileen. And you're quite right to say that that, that it, it is the, the views of that 99, uh, that group of 99 people. So and 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 it would be really useful in your presentation uh, to to show that process, uh, just to, to, to show people uh, how pe how those people were selected. Um, so please do, if you could share your, your uh, presentation just while you're doing that to let everybody know that you can send us your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And today's session has been recorded and will be available on the Chagas website over the coming days, as well as the Chagas YouTube channel and uh, any of the podcast platforms as well. You can listen back to this webinar in your car or in your tractor or wherever you are. So <laughs> Evie, we'll hand over to you and uh, we'll chat to you after your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. And it's great that you have so many channels um, set up for this. It's, it's an amazing webinar series. So thanks again. It's, it's a pleasure to be part of it today, particularly as part of National Biodiversity Week. Um, so as Mark said, I was invited to be chair of the Citizens Assembly on Biodiversity Loss which was set up by the Iraq this last February, so February 2022. Um, when I initially got the invitation to take on the role, I actually said no, because even though I knew the state had declared a biodiversity loss crisis um, in 2019, I didn't really know much else and I didn't think I was the best candidate for the job, but I was informed that as chair, really what my role was, was to make sure that the members of the assembly was, would be as informed as possible to make recommendations back to the Oireachtas on how to solve this issue. So we had very extensive uh, terms of reference, um, but I'm gonna talk initially through process of the citizens assembly, um, just so everyone kind of is aware of that. Um, so citizens assemblies are becoming used more and more as tools to strengthen democracy. So the OECD has recorded over 600 examples of citizens assemblies, both national and regional, all around the world since the 1980s. It actually began in Canada as a process. Um, and then we will know that it came to Ireland um, in the turn of the century, really, or yeah, yeah the, in the 2000s. And, and we've seen that, you know, it, it has transformative um, changes, made transformative changes um, in society. But the difference to a citizen assembly to, I don't know, maybe doing a poll or something like that, is that members spend time to become informed about a particular topic. And then they deliver or return back reflective, informed opinions on a particular issue. They vote on what they're going to put forward. So it's a majority process. So it, it is democracy in and of itself. But what they try to do is bring the everyday person, so non-policymakers, into policy work. And um, so rather than just talking to lobby groups or industry groups or, or specific stakeholder groups, the Citizens Assembly process asks the everyday person, um, what do you think about this? And it gives politicians often a, kind of a temperature check 
on what the wider population might think about a particular topic. Um, so we know in Ireland that we've had a lot of changes come about through Citizens' Assembly, and Ireland stands out as a unique case in the world because of the changes that have come through Citizens' Assembly. So we had marriage equality um, in 2018, blasphemy was removed from the Constitution, and um, the Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change led to the Climate Action and Carbon uh, Development Act last year. So they're becoming a main reference point um, for big conversations in the country. And just to remind everyone as well that the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly are only recommendations. It's still up to the pol politicians to decide what they want to do, but now they have an extra kind of uh, tool uh, to say, well, this is what the Citizens' Assembly has said. And when we've had referenda, we've seen that however many people voted in the assembly of those 99 members, um, we've seen that directly reflected in, for example, the referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment. There was almost a direct correlation between those numbers. So in Ireland, we can say that generally our citizens um, are representative when they're chosen to be part of an assembly. So in this citizen assembly, that choice or that process of, of finding citizens uh, was slightly different. So previous to this, they were found from people on the electoral register. But, you know, people, many um, people would say that, you know, if you're on the electoral register, that's probably missing out members of society that aren't registered to vote or don't want to register to vote. So this time, what they did was they took 20,000 addresses from the OnPost Geo Directory and sent out an invitation from Antishuk uh, to be part of the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss to those 20,000 places. So you can see that in the first map there on the left. Um, over 2,300 people responded, and that's the map in the middle. So all of these people from across the country, and you can see the very tip of Donegal down to the, um, the, the very bottom or the wilds of Kerry, um, people said, yeah, I actually would like to be part of this civic duty, and I will give up my time to do this. And of those 2,300, 99 were chosen so that they would be representative broadly of society. So we had, you know, 50-50 uh, gender split, uh, 23 people from Munster, six full-time farmers, 12 18 to 24 year olds, 19 65 year olds or older. And um, we had very many part-time farmers because we didn't realize uh, what people hadn't put it down as their main occupation. So a lot of part-time farmers and then a lot of other people who are married to farmers or direct neighbors to farmers. Um, and over two thirds of people were from non-urban settings. So there was a good representation from, let's say, rural Ireland and from the farming community. Now, a question that gets asked a lot is, well, well, who are these people that could give up all of their time? Obviously, they must be all uh, retired or something like that. And that certainly isn't the case. Um, we had all across from all the spectrums of society. And here's one picture that we took at the very first meeting that we had. We had one Leaving Cert student all the way up to an 88 year old um, we had solicitors, uh, retired taxi drivers, um, an oyster farmer. Uh, we had uh, people from Dingle, people from Donegal, um, from Midlands, so all across Ireland. And software engineers, you know, anyone you could think of, there was a representation there. Um, so I think it's it's great to see um, that type of representation. We had a person who was living in Ireland from Estonia, they'd been here 20 years. We had a person from Ukraine who's been in Ireland for 10 years, another from Argentina who's been here for about five years. So a lovely snapshot of Irish society, that's what it was. And the work of the assembly was held over um, weekends, seven weekends in total um, in a hotel in Dublin. But what contributed to that work was that we also had submissions. So, so we had 600 and 47 submissions from Ireland and from around the world. And I actually was blown away by the interest from around the world on this because we were the first country to hold a Citizens' Assembly of Biodiversity Laws. And there was great interest in that. And you'll see at the bottom of my slide here um, that we had a video from a tribe's uh, chief uh, in Ecuador who was asking the Citizens' Assembly not only to consider biodiversity and biodiversity loss in Ireland, but also the impacts that we have as Irish people on biodiversity around the world. Um, so very, um, the, the submissions really informed the work 
uh, of the assembly. And we also had 87 speakers representing a wide variety of sectors and organizations. We had 20 from NGOs, non-governmental organizations, 16 from agriculture and business. We had 11 from state or government agencies, 10 um, university speakers, nine individuals, eight talks by the expert advisory group, um, who were a, a group of people who would advise me and speak with me in the secretariat about who might come in or how we might design the program, et cetera. Um, we had members of the Children and Young People's Assembly address us. Um, we had also four local authorities address us. Um, so what you'll see up on the slide here is one of the members of uh, a farming association. So we had um, nine different farming associations represented in our session on agriculture. Um, and then we had voices from the community. And this was really important to me as chair. I didn't just want people who were in the industry or in the research zone. I wanted to hear from people on the ground. In that regard, we got to hear from community groups. Um, we did a video of community work all around the country, friends of Merlin Wood, friends of Mac River. Um, we had here uh, Moorlink Ireland. Um, so lots of different perspectives. And that was really important that we just got as many perspectives as we could about biodiversity loss in Ireland. So I said there that um, I had thankfully an expert advisory group to advise us on how we should plan um, the work. Um, and throughout this, it was always informed by members, but we decided to take a sectoral approach. So we looked at the, um, these kind of different sectors because this was where kind of policy lands in this kind of a way. So you'll see there protected sites and species, agriculture, forestry and woodlands, peatlands, freshwater, marine and coastal and urban and built environments. We didn't plan everything from the beginning because it's very important in a citizens assembly that members can constantly, um, you know, be involved and inform the process. And coming up to our second meeting, um, and well, actually, sorry, in our second meeting, a lot of the members were asking me, we want to hear more about the judicial rights, the environmental rights aspect of it. And so then we incorporated a session on environmental rights. Invasive species was coming up a lot. And so we included something in that. Um, we got requests then from members to specifically have a session on industry, which involves tourism as well. And we did that. Um, energy production was coming up. And even though this wasn't a citizens assembly on climate change, that's been done before, energy production is was very much linked with some of the conversations we're having on varying biodiversity so we included a session on that and throughout all of the conversations uh, education was a key theme educating the public having biodiversity as part of our formal certificates and informal primary and post-primary education and so we had a session on that as well so we were the first citizens assembly to take um a field trip and that was actually great to get just some knowledge on the ground about, you know, if you're a local authority, what can you be doing? If you're a business, what can you be doing? If you're a protected site, what's the work that's going on there? And we also encouraged um, members who weren't farmers to visit farming sites um, over last summer with some maybe farming for nature walks and things like that that were going on. And the work itself then, when we were in meetings, involved people being at tables, as you can see there, so it's usually around 10 people at a table. One of those was an, a professional facilitator and one of those was a professional note taker. And we would have a short presentation, 15 minutes, um, one or two of those, and then the members would discuss for about half an hour to 45 minutes, and then they would have questions. So a lot of talking happens at a citizens' assembly, a lot of ideas and a lot of questions. And it's a great process. Oh, I felt very privileged to be part of it because people were very respectful of differing views at the tables. Um, and everybody got to say what they wanted to say because of the facilitator. And we surveyed people every weekend to say, you know, do you feel like you got to, you know, uh, outline your perspective? Did you feel like you got to hear other perspectives? And did you change your mind? And it was fascinating for me to see that Every weekend, the majority of people said, yeah, I changed my mind because actually I, I never sat and talked with this type of farmer before, or I never sat and looked at it from that legal perspective or the financial perspective, or whatever it was. So people were really, really thinking, considering, ruminating over what they were hearing and talking about it. Um, so there was a lot of work in all of that. But uh, at the same time, it was important for me that we developed kind of a, a sense of community. So I cracked all the bad jokes and there was a lot of good laughter there 
Um, and I think we've built up a good sense of trust, which is really important because you have to have a room where people can have different views. That was hugely important. And, and that really carried through all the way to the end. You know, this wasn't a room where there was everyone was agreeing on everything. People said their piece and there were contentious discussions over some. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but overall, a very collaborative piece of work. And I was blown away by the quality of the questions that were asked here because presenters were interrogated. And as somebody who was new to citizen assemblies, I really didn't think that, you know, people there, you know, average people coming up and I say them with the most respect, you know, but these are members of society who are in, like who wanted to do this on behalf of their fellow Irish men and women. They were giving up their time, missing family events, you know, traveling long distances. They were doing it as part of a metal, uh, you know, you know, so coming together for their for their countrymen and women to do this. And they did a great job doing it. They, you know, read stuff beforehand, watched videos beforehand, listened and interrogated. Um, so it was just a privilege for me to be part of it. And so when we started the work, we had to find out, well, what is biodiversity? Because, you know, really that room wasn't sure. Um, as I said, we had people from all different walks of life, you know, single parents, retirees, um, you know, just people who would have no experience of, of nature, some of them. And so we started off with this, you know, learning what is biodiversity. And we learned that, you know, it impacts all Earth and, and all life on Earth. And really, it's the systems that underpin all of the environment that we have. And I have found it very difficult to find an image that captures biodiversity. This may be one of the closest ones, because you can't think of biodiversity in and of itself as something that's, you know, doesn't impact anything. It impacts everything around us, all the way from, you know, the water that we drink and the quality of that water, the soil that we get our food from, or that the animals are getting their food from that we then eat. Um, it impacts on our air quality, um, it providing us with food in that entire system. So even though a, bio, a, a pond can be a, divide, a biodiverse system in and of itself, that is part of a bigger system and, and something that I hope my mathematical background can actually help me with because that's all about systems and interconnected systems. And so biodiversity really underpins all life and we depend on it fundamentally. And um, if, if we don't have this nature, we do not have the capacity to survive as a species ourselves. We then learned about what are the drivers of biodiversity loss. And the five main drivers are habitat loss. So habitat being taken for different uses, over exploitation. We've seen examples of that in Ireland and around the world. Pollution, which I think is very obvious. Invasive species, and even though the rhododendron might look very beautiful to some people, it's invasive and it's damaging other plants um, and wildlife. And then climate change. So climate change and biodiversity are intrinsically linked. And the good news out of that is an area that is biodiverse is actually better protected from the impacts of climate change. And so by acting on one, we can, we can actually protect ourselves from the other. But unfortunately, with all of this, it's projected that by 2050, only 10% of the Earth will be in a near natural state. And in the next 100 to 150 years, 13% of all species will be threatened with extinction. That's a projected um, forecast if we go on the track that we're on now. And at least one third of the protected species in Ireland are declining in population. And with this, you know, we had to start off with, well, you know, how bad is biodiversity loss in Ireland? And unfortunately, it's pretty bad. Over a quarter of our regularly occurring bird species are in long term decline. The birds that overwinter in Ireland are down by 50% since the 1990s. And the endemic species that are found in Ireland are of particular concern. Um, we're consistently losing our hedgerows, uh, which is the life source of the country. And one of our speakers um, spoke of it as the blood system of the country, because really it's so important to habitats. And unfortunately, we're really not regarding them or respecting them. We have the lowest uh, forest cover of any country in Europe and only 2% of our land has native broadleaf um, and monoculture forests are contributing to biodiversity loss as does, does certain management practices of forests. Um, less than half of our marine environment can be described as healthy. And as an island nation, I think that's something that's you know very regrettable um, and terribly unfortunate. 
Our peatlands, which improve and regulate water, are a hugely important carbon store as well, um, but they're very vulnerable habitats and we're not looking after them to the extent that we should be. Almost 30% of our semi-natural grasslands have been lost in the last decade and 85% of protected habitats in Ireland are in unfavourable condition. And that's the habitat that we're supposed to be protecting. We're really, really not doing a good job um, of that. Um, agricultural soil is often in suboptimal state um, and nitrate is particularly challenging because it's going into the groundwater and to freely draining land and into estuaries and we heard that this is particularly happening around um, the south coast and it's been a huge drop in water quality since 2015 and um, unfortunately the number of near pristine river sites have declined from 500 in the 1980s to 32 today that's pretty frightening um, and 20 to 30 percent of freshwater biodiversity are vulnerable um, and we heard in the freshwater session which was the most depressing of any of the sessions, in my opinion, that we're at a tipping point in terms of our fresh water. And after this, if we don't act now, it might be impossible to reverse this damage. That was directly coming from the scientists and, and up-to-date data that we have in Ireland. Um, so this was really um, so depressing. And just an example of some of the species that were at risk of losing, you know, the freshwater pearl mussel, the Atlantic salmon, the great yellow bumblebee. And these aren't just species that it's a shame to lose. Um, if one of those goes, it impacts on everything else. And we had Dr. Jane Goodall speak to us about this. And she talked of nature as a tapestry. And she said, if you pull a thread here and there, you know, the tapestry is still there, but you keep pulling the threads and eventually the whole tapestry is going to fall apart. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We're pulling the threads and we're just hoping that the next one isn't going to be um, a dramatic one. But everybody will have their own personal story of this. And mine, you saw this in the first slide, is Loch Cara. So this is close to where I grew up, Carnacona County Mayo. And it's a beautiful lake. It's a marl lake. It has this gorgeous uh, limestone base. But unfortunately, um, it's been polluted to a terrible extent and there's not a huge amount of fish there anymore um, thankfully now there's a great life project that's looking to rejuvenate it but that was just a personal example of biodiversity loss that I didn't actually even consider until I started my role as chair of the citizens assembly and I really want to acknowledge that I brought you through the depressing point for a good reason because Irish people have a very respectful intrinsic link with the land and where they come from and you know this is one of the most beautiful photos of uh Kirkpatrick and like it's so intrinsic and it's something that I have to explain to my husband he's half Spanish and doesn't get it doesn't get the connection to the land that Irish people have we are so proud of it but unfortunately we haven't been doing a good job of looking after it and this is where um we really need to think about not only are we in love with the land in Ireland, but we really need it because healthy ecosystems give us functions to survive. And nature provides us with ecosystem services like water purification, like pollination for a third of our food is depending on pollinators, like photosynthesis for the food we eat, for carbon sequestration, climate regulation, and many more. We depend on nature. We are depending on it. And we have done this kind of without question for decades. But we're realizing now that nature is actually not something that's an add on to our lives. We exist in it. And so does our economy. And if our economy keeps pushing and pushing and pushing, eventually the nature is going to not be able to sustain it anymore. So we're at this point now and the members of the Citizens Assembly were really, really emphatic that they wanted their message to get across that the state has to take prompt and decisive urgent action to address biodiversity loss and restoration and provide leadership in this because the members of this citizens assembly those 99 members who came up with these recommendations believes that the state has comprehensively failed to fund implement and enforce existing national legislation and policies we actually have loads of policies and loads of legislation to protect nature we're just not enforcing it and that was one of the most frustrating points for the members throughout the meetings, finding out that, oh, no, we've got something to protect this, 
but it's not being enforced. And this could be protected, but it's not being enforced. So while I've brought us through this kind of depressing narrative, don't be too depressed, because thankfully, the members of this Citizens' Assembly have provided us with a blueprint for how we can actually turn this around and how we can move ourselves back from this tipping point. And this is Liam. And Liam himself stood up in the last day of our meeting to say that he had started saving lives and no longer wanted to kill the magpies and jagdtoes in his garden for the sake of the little ones. He realised now that all elements of nature should be there and nature will find its own balance if we allow it to. Nature can be really re resilient. We just need to give it a little help in that regard. And so bringing us through some of the recommendations from the Citizens Assembly, and there are many, and I would ask you to go to the report because um, you'll see it in detail and you'll see all the speakers that we had in it. And you'll see a lot of what the speakers said um, echoed in the recommendations because the members really listened to it. But they really want, for example, the state to communicate and implement a plan for conservation and restoration of biodiversity for the benefit of its people. Because this is something for all of us. If it's on someone's land that something happens, fine. But that actually has a broader impact on society. And particularly to actually protect the high nature value areas that we have. The beautiful landscapes that we pride ourselves in and sell ourselves on in terms of tourism. We at least have to be looking after those. So the top 20 recommendations are kind of like the high level overview vision of um, the recommendations. And in particular on that, and I think it's very relevant with the conversations that we're having right now, the farmers who spoke to us asked us that Ireland review its cheap food policy in the context of biodiversity crisis. We can't have high quality food if we're not prepared to pay for it. And if we want high quality food, that means we have to have high quality land and we need to be able to value the environment that it comes from. And so we have to think about this, but the members have also suggested in this, we have to consider the vulnerable sections of society who can't maybe afford to pay for this quality food, but consider the long-term investment of having good food for your healthcare system, et cetera. And so this is something that the members are asking government to really consider and to consider carefully. And they've also put in their top 20 recommendations that we need to drastically reduce the use of pesticides in line with the EU policy and incentivize and encourage domestic and commercial use of natural cost-friendly alternatives. And interestingly enough, it was the farming members of the assembly who were quite vocal in considering the wording for this um, part of it. And, and as I said, every recommendation that we went through had a majority of those 99 members um, vote for them or agree, or agree with them. Also considering good practice of um, biodiversity protection and um, that we should all be doing that in partnership and to learn from things that have happened well, like the Burn Programme, like the Bride Project, um, like SUIS. And in that, that we have to think about this as a whole of state approach and align what we want to do for biodiversity with the Climate Action Plan and not be constrained by electoral cycles. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but the members of this assembly really, really wanted to hit home on that. This isn't about us because the damage has been done for our age group. And I say this as a 40 year old, this is really thinking about the generations that come after us because we're not leaving them a good legacy at the moment. And so the decisions that we make and the timelines for funding shouldn't be constrained by electoral cycles. We have to do things in the long term. And they also suggested that a new biodiversity um, plan um, should be developed in partnership with people and sectors most affected. And while a lot of maybe agencies would say, oh, we're doing this, we're doing stakeholder involvement. What we heard from members who spoke to the assembly was that this seemed to be tokenistic and wasn't really taken into account and wasn't valuable. They didn't see what they were saying within policies. And so there has to be meaningful engagement with stakeholders in that regard. Um, I just want to include this as well, that in terms of maybe we have a, a stronger, a strong agriculture um, viewership today, that we should have a, um, a research strategy to support um, the national and EU biodiversity soil and water strategies for all agencies and create, publish and maintain an integrated habitat map, a species map and a land usage map. Now, some of these are already in, in train um, as of this year, which is great. 
um, but this is what the members have suggested. And I want to just suggest or mention here that the members of the Citizens Assembly didn't want to just leave it at the high level recommendations because they were so frustrated that nothing has been done in this for decades, that this is why they wanted to put in specific recommendations across each sector. And this is basically the blueprint. What exactly do you need to do across these sectors now to make sure that we're um, protecting ourselves against further biodiversity loss and then trying to reverse it? So this is where they really went into detail. That's why there's a lot more recommendations in this Citizens Assembly than in previous ones. They wanted to get into the nitty gritty of it. And you'll see that they've considered a lot of detail across this. So subsidizing and incentivizing more organic farming and supporting locally grown produce. This was key, that it was not just about what you eat, it's about how far the food you eat has come from and really trying to get that message across to consumers in general. Members also wanted that, you know, all departments try and work collaboratively on this because biodiversity isn't just in one area. Um, it spans energy, transport, planning, agriculture, marine, education, higher education, all of these different departments uh, need to work together on it. Um, they also suggested that national schemes should be significantly more ambitious and detailed and focused on the long term. And there has to be funding to do this. Now we saw that the new cap came in in January and there were definitely some positive uh, aspects of that for biodiversity, but members of this Citizens Assembly wanted that to be even more ambitious. And to also, and I think this was important to put in here, incentivize the farmers and do not restrict them in their ambition. Don't cap their payment if they're doing a great job. And I heard a great analogy during the week. If you're bringing a cow to market and the cow is in great condition, you will get a good price for it at the mart. It's the same with your field. If you're bringing a field and it is in great biodiverse condition, you should get that payment for that because you worked for it, you've, you've conserved it. Um, and that's really what the members wanted to get across here. And also that, you know, the various um, uh, considerations that farmers are being encouraged to do right now, that that needs to be um, across the board, that there should be more encouragement of multi-species swords and mixtures, um, silver pasture land, um, in considering water that you expand the riparian buffer zones between where the farm is and where the, the water source is, particularly upstream, because it was the health of the upstream parts of the water that were really um, kind of desecrating what was happening later. And that farmers should have access to training and up-to-date research on this should they want to participate in it. Members wanted a new strategy to protect the hedgerows. The hedgerows seem to be the unsung heroes of biodiversity across the land because they are immense places for, um, for wildlife um, and they're not being protected to the full extent that they should be. So hedge management courses and certifications should be reintroduced and all hedge cutting contractors and their employees complete these. And um, so these were just some of the recommendations I wanted to share with you today. Um, they wanted to have an assessment of the Forestry Act so that Quilcher could actually focus on biodiversity um, as, as well as you know, creating profit. And members of this assembly wanted to ensure that state-owned woodlands are recognized as long-term strategic assets um, to protect um, the boglands, but also to offer the financial resistance required to people who are depending on that turf. We heard from communities who are so proud of coming from the bog and want to be part of the next generation of stories of what that bog is, and that we should try, try and start to look after our bogs like we look after our Book of Kells, because our cultural heritage is so important um, and we don't value it like that. And then for rural, uh, urban settings, you know, more green spaces, more community gardens, more considerations of you know, how we can use urban settings like that bus stop that I showed you here, that's in Utrecht, um, and, and uh, they, they're kind of detailed further. And I, I want to include this, that in terms of rights, that the members of this assembly agreed with what the UN have just declared as a human right. They only declared it in December 2022. Uh, we were actually just ahead of them because we had agreed this recommendation before that that as a person, you have the right to a clean, healthy, safe environment. 
members of this assembly said that is hugely important we've just been taking it for granted but actually that might not be accessible to everyone anymore with the way we're going so we should put it into our constitution and also they considered that well nature maybe has a right to not be polluted or not be dug up or not be bulldozed over and in this regard i did think myself well, this is, it's a bit much is it but actually i spoke at the un general assembly last month and Ireland is only just joining in in this conversation where other countries already have it in their constitution and other countries are already giving rights to elements of nature. So in Spain, a lagoon called Mar Menor already has rights to be protected because it's been polluted for generations. Um, and in New Zealand, a national park and a river um, is already protected in law with rights. Um, and these conversations about constitutional practices are already happening in Italy, Germany, Holland, Finland um, and more around the world, Canada. And so it's kind of actually inspiring for me that the members of this Citizens Assembly have shown that they're, they're, they're forward thinking. And again, the Citizens Assembly demonstrates we're far ahead of the politics, the people are thinking about this. And cathedral thinking is something that resonated with me from the, one of the first speakers that we had, that we shouldn't be thinking in five year cycles of elections. We need to be thinking, what can we do now for the generation coming 300 years time? Like the people who built the cathedrals for us, they knew that they weren't going to reap the benefits of seeing it, practicing, but they were doing it for the generations to come. And in that regard, this is where biodiversity becomes very personal because in our last session, the older members of our assemblies were talking about their grandchildren. And making sure that we have an Ireland that we can be proud of giving over to them, that they don't have to work to, to, to look after it even more to try and reverse the things that we've been doing. And the younger members of the assembly were also very vocal on that, and obviously parents. So this is something that's intergenerational now. We have to look after biodiversity for ourselves, because if we protect nature, it will protect us. So that was a whistle stop tour. I'm very happy to take uh, questions now on the assembly and Gurmaga Blair for tuning in and uh, for looking at this work. And hopefully um, we'll see now if with the Oireachtas, it's been returned to the Oireachtas and they will now make decisions on, on what they might do as our public representatives. Thanks very much, Eveen. Uh, thank and really good overview of what, what happened and, and maybe we could maybe dive into some of the, the conversations that were, were had. I'm sure lots of people were interested to see what, you know, the, 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 some of the outcomes from the your discussions. Um, just you, you talked about the next steps. I mean, what would you like to see happening next? I know it's the, it's down to mm -hmm. the Eructus members now to, to, to drive this on, but from your own standpoint, what would you like to see happening? If I'm allowed to ask that question. Well, everyone asks me that question. And the only way I can answer it, Mark, is it depends on who you're talking to. So if it's me and I work in the education space and I'm on the department's STEM education group, I feel like I can take some of those recommendations and maybe, you know, become an advocate for that because that's my education space. So it depends on who you're talking to. If I'm talking to the politicians, I would potentially say, well, some of the policy issues or the enforcement issues might be the most important. But I, I feel that because the recommendations span all the different sectors, Different bodies, different people can take out different things and see how they might consider what the members have, have suggested here. Probably does need to feature in their plans, though. It needs to be hardwired as whatever comes out of that Oireachtas process. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Obviously, change. you know, these are only recommendations. And now it is back to our, our TDs and our senators to decide what might happen with them. And can I ask, Aveen, uh, you you had um, farmer representatives speaking to the group. You know how how aligned did you feel the the uh, the viewpoints were following those those uh, those discussions or those presentations? Well, you know, I think it's very interesting that when we when we hear people talk about farmers, you know, as if they're one generic group. Do you know, because, you know, a, a farmer down in Cork is going to be very different to a farmer in West Mayo, going to be very different to another farmer in the Midlands. Do you know, so I think really great. that was really important that we got all, we got a host of different farm associations, the Grain Growers Association, the Organic Farmers, and we had the Hill and Natura Farmers, the ICSA, ICMSA, the IFA, Hall of Bio, 
you know, uh, Burnbio, like we had different farmer groups come in and obviously there's not consensus on everything. But I think what the members got consensus from was we have to support farmers. If we're asking them to do this work on our behalf, because they can be the heroes in this regard. They really are the, the ones who can, you know, respond to biodiversity because it's it's nearly 70% of the land in Ireland that's, that's agricultural land. So the farmers are the heroes. We have to ask them to do this and then reward them for doing it. And, and, and it's really valuing that. And I think our language needs to change because certainly where I'm from, it's bad land, do you know? But actually, bad land agriculturally for for, for production is generally very high nature value and so it's like well what does that really mean it's actually spectacular land if you want to think about it from a nature's perspective so it's it kind of i think being careful about our our, our language and our thinking in that regard and um, but that was certainly something that came through and you'll see it very much in the recommendations support farmers provide them with community frameworks and peer-to-peer -peer learning because that is the best way for knowledge to be shared and to be generated and um, give them that support and also don't cap good work that they're doing you know reward them for the good work that they're doing so they, they were very clear recommendations from the members and i know that uh discussion around uh food uh versus nature um and you talked about the five main drivers of biodiversity loss there's one common denominator there the the human being uh, being yeah. the, the 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 main driver, but you know how do, how was was there much discussion around that that balance between economic activity, the need for economic activity, and biodiversity loss? Yeah, there there was. There's actually a whole section on resourcing, um, but you know the, the restoration of biodiversity loss, and really the members were very important on that because they really considered that that if you saw that circle where you have nature and then you have the economy inside it. And if we are keeping asking the economy to grow, 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 it's not possible. There's a boundary on it. And, and the members really took that to say, can we actually think about how well we're doing as a country in broader terms than just um, the money that we're making? So that's a recommendation that's in there. And also in that regard, it, it was very clear throughout that people wanted more information on, I should know more about what the decisions I make in my everyday life and the impact that they have. And that's where they've said, you know, there should be a, a public campaign about, you know, buying local and there should be a public com campaign about, you know, the foods that we eat. Now, there is a recommendation in there to say that people should be encouraged to have a more plant based diet. But that doesn't say that people should be encouraged to eat less meat. It's yes, we should have more plant based diet, but also the local produce is, is very much highlighted in there because we learned from one of our presenters the impact of the food that is coming from abroad avocados is used a lot but actually chocolate has a massive carbon uh, footprint which i was horrified about um so we really need to and you know and the the animal feed that we're taking from brazil in particular that's damaging biodiversity enormously there but we're not supporting the farmers to grow that same feed here because there's a competition of resources and so it's thinking about this in a bigger picture. So those conversations definitely were had and the members haven't said that they have all the answers, but they're outlining that these are really things, they're complex issues that we need to have discussions about. Absolutely, you know, there, it is, it is, it ain't straightforward. Um, Catherine, some really good questions coming through there from yeah. the viewers. Yeah, and compliments, Avine, on um, on the fantastic presentation. A couple of just factual questions there. Um, I, can you get a hard copy of the report? And if not, or if so, where can you get the soft copy? Uh, very uh, good question. I actually don't know if we can get a hard copy. I, I had to fight hard to get the printers uh, because we didn't want to print a huge amount. But it's all available on citizensassembly.ie. There's a link I've actually included the link there in the chat there for people to right. download the report. So, um, And actually, the Irish Times uh, had a, an editorial to say it's very accessible and everyone should read it. And that was something that as a science communicator, I wanted to make sure this was something that anybody can read and you can you know have a look at it over your cornflakes. Um, and it was something that the members wanted to be certain about as well. It's not written as a policy document. It's written as a document 
for people because these members of the Citizens Assembly were doing this for their fellow Irish men and women. So yeah, it's an accessible document um, in as much as we were able to make it. And another question about the process. Can you explain how expert advisors to the Assembly were chosen and their role during the sittings and writing of the report? Yeah, so um, when I was invited to be chair of the Citizens Assembly, um, a number of uh, people had already been identified as potential experts. And then we just had big conversations with um, the Secretariat. I then went away and had separate conversations with lots of different people because it's an important process to get that group right. So we need people who have expertise, but we need people who are also um, haven't necessarily demonstrated a particular leaning either way, that they're very much informed by research and data. Um, so that was something we had to consider. And then we also had to make sure that we were considering Ireland as an island. And so we had Professor Ian Montgomery from Queen's University of Belfast, who was an expert in invasive species. Um, we had to have a member who was an expert in deliberative democracy. And um, we have a professor of botany there with someone with marine expertise. We had a person um, who had expertise working with uh, EPA. Um, and so, and then another person who was uh, an expert in agricultural policy and practice, another who was an expert in legal elements and particularly elements of Brexit that kind of might have impacted on this, but also the human uh, or the, the environmental rights. So it was trying to get that spectrum of people that you could also suggest were very balanced in their approach, because that's something where we didn't want to have a bias in either direction or either way. And for example, thinking about economy, we had a member of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, and then we had a presenter who presented on donut economics, two kind of almost uh, challenging views. But that's where the members then will come up with their own ideas. So that was something that we had to carefully consider. OK, a comment more so from Alan Moore that Hedgerows Ireland were pleased with the, the recommendations on the hedges. And um, their mantra is our hedges are the equivalent of the um, Amazon rainforest. I think you mentioned that. And uh, they really endorse the view that knowledge is the key to positive change. Um, Interesting uh, suggestion here, um, Evine, around the, the need for nature and biodiversity as a sh should it be a core subject within primary and post primary curriculums immediately is something this person is well yeah and interestingly I, I had a passing conversation with somebody in the national council for curriculum and assessment yesterday and sent them the report um, because it's really something that came through so obviously where we had nature tables before and i certainly had a nature table in primary school it's not common practice anymore and mm -hmm. we had some teachers in from the irish school sustainability network um, and one of them you know, said that the teenagers in his class thought a heron was a swan. Um, you know, I, I had kids telling me dandelion was a daffodil. Uh, you know, we were not we're not sharing the knowledge with our young people in the way that they deserve. And they want it. Kids absolutely love nature. So in that regard, the, there is a primary curriculum review at the moment happening and there will be a wing and element of it that's around sustainability. My argument is you have to put it directly into the sciences as well. I work here in the College of Science in UCD. Nearly every colleague I have has some element of work underpinning sustainability because it's one of the biggest global challenges that we're dealing with. So yes, I think nature and um, environment needs to be a fundamentally core element of the science work that we do, as well as thinking about it in a um, well-being um, aspect as well. Um, considering the, the, the wider countryside, uh, a comment about somebody uh, constantly alarmed about the number of individual homeowners who manage the verges outside by spraying our lawns. Um, was there any recommendation for that? Not specifically, maybe, but... Well, you know, so this is where there's a couple of recommendations to talk about education, because I don't know if a lot of people would like, know the damage that it's doing. And also a reduction of the pesticides and herbicides. And also um, there was a recommendation in there on kind of, you know, selling products that are damaging like that as well. So, you know, selling those sprays is an issue, but maybe selling, you know, plants that are actually invasive. You know, my dad saw in a, a market last weekend a uh, rhododendron for sale for 40 quid. And it's just like, we're, we're trying to get rid of them. You know, why are we selling them privately? So I think individuals just need 
information and education. And part of that, members of this citizen assembly recommended that there should be an overall body that's in charge of coordinating all of the actions that are happening, but also in charge of public education, public engagement, that, that communication of the science, because it's kind of falling between all the stools here. It's actually not in the department that looks after climate change. It's biodiversity is a an element of the Department of Housing. So I think it, it's just not getting the focus that it deserves. And that's a recommendation from the members of this assembly. Another comment from a dairy farmer feeling the discussion in the citizens assembly was, was very well balanced um, and the agricultural industry as a whole would do well to, to listen to the webinar and, and follow your recommendations. And can I follow on with my own question on that? Because these farmers are very much involved in discussion groups and that came up through the citizens assembly. And I just wonder your own thoughts about the um, the, the, the potential of the discussion group model for progressing biodiversity. Um, yeah, well, I just want to say, like, it's lovely to hear that feedback from a dairy farmer, because I think this this is what you see from a citizens assembly. It's a measured conversation because it has the value of time. It's not a 10 minute radio interview where two people are pitted against each other. These are people who gave up a lot of time and discussed and listened carefully. And in that regard, I did my best to, to meet as many farmers as possible last summer. And I actually met farmers who were involved in discussion groups and it seemed to be such a fabulous way for them to share ideas but also share practices and to kind of give them confidence in what they're doing but also to try new things and I I, I felt uh, Catherine that it actually has a lot of resonance with the work that I do because I look at curriculum reform and teachers and it's the same thing that if you tell a math teacher here's the new curriculum you have to teach now in a completely different way than you did for the last 20 years it just doesn't work it doesn't happen like that and actually, my research would show that when you do it in a community and you have a community of practice, that's where people build trust, they build, build confidence, they start to try new things. And I think there might be some symbiosis there with the farmers, but you'll see that threaded throughout the recommendations of the assembly, the, that the members of the assembly want farmers to be supported in their communities because farming is very local. So this, what happens in this area will be very specific to that part of that county and it'll be very different to a different part of a different county and so that's where the localized element that community-based um, network where they have access to knowledgeable advisors who are you know talking about biodiversity and thinking about it um you know is, is really really important um even you're here today because we know that farming has a lot of influence on biodiversity and uh is a, is a major stakeholder um I suppose some, some of the questions coming through here is have have you or will you be engaging with other stakeholders who are also uh responsible and uh oh god, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, because I, I suppose there is that some that feeling amongst farmers that you know we're the, the farmers are the soft target. Um mm -hmm. there was uh EPA recently published uh figures around emissions. Um the aeronautical industry was one of the highest, uh, but yet didn't seem to feature in the, the headlines. Yeah, so, I, I know. Um, and it's, it, it is, it's a terrible, um, it's terrible kind of what's happening in the media. And, and it's, I, I do think it's, sometimes it's it's clickbait almost, because if you pit two people against each other, you know, it it seems to be, oh, that's the way to do it. And, and it's re really not in my, in, in my um, considerations. And just to reiterate, like, I'm in no way pointing fingers here because everybody needs to take responsibility for themselves. And this is in the assembly as well. Agriculture is just one sector that we looked at, but I was focusing on a little bit on it today because it's it's a webinar for, for Chagas. Um, but it does, that does not mean that everyone else get, gets off scot-free. We all have to take personal responsibility. Education is part of that, but also, you know, to be incentivized or not. And in that regard, you know, I'm trying to not use our car um, I'm cycling to work. We are not flying anywhere this summer. You know, we're doing our own things. But I do think, yeah, absolutely, emissions need to be targeted for cars, for everything else, um, and to look at all the other sectors. Saying that, it's important that we have this conversation in the agricultural space because 70% of the land of Ireland goes towards agricultural practices. But equally so, this needs to be focused on forestry. It needs to be focused on energy production. You know, there are lots and, and tourism needs to be there. Businesses need to be there. So there's a lot of things that need to happen 
within policy and within other aspects of society that need to show up to this. But in this regard, I think that this can be a really positive news story because in terms of biodiversity, no one knows nature in the land like farmers. Farmers can be our heroes in this. They are our Marvel characters that can actually bring the rest of us back from the brink. And this is where the members of the assembly want to, to celebrate and acknowledge farmers for all of that work that they do and also ask government to support them in that. They have to produce food because we require that, but they're also there to look after our environment and we need to just get that balance right, that, it, that economy, society and nature, we need to just get that balance right. Just one question there, uh, Mark, on soil biodiversity and soil health and its knock-on effect to broader ecosystem services. I think soil biodiversity did feature. Any comment on that, Avine? Oh, yeah, there is a couple of um, recommendations specifically there on soil health and discussing soil health and also wanting to have more resources for individuals, landowners who aren't farmers, to find out more about their soil health. So soil was not neglected. It is directly in there. If you, if you download um, if you download the report, you, you'll see that. Really nice comment here. Uh, in, it says, congratulations, Evine. Truly excellent to hear from our citizens sharing such wonderful vision and wisdom on the ways to protect and gain greater understanding on our interconnection with all nature. But how can we keep this conversation alive and continue to share this wisdom uh, uh, and way forward? So, I mean, there is always a risk that this is another report that ends up on a shelf somewhere and great intentions and so on yeah. um but uh how, how do we keep it alive it's a great question and it's something that i've been thinking about since i was asked to do this job the first thing you do is you talk about it so if you are a person who believes in biodiversity you know go volunteer in your local school to give a talk go volunteer in your local men's sheds and your local women's association talk to everybody talk to the tidy towns group join the tidy towns group you know have the conversations because we've seen in Ireland previously it's the conversations at the kitchen table that create change for my role even though it's officially over I can now advocate for those recommendations and I am having as many conversations as I can within reason that I still have to do my actual work here in ECD and um, but I'm talking to people who are interested and I will be presenting to the Iraq this um, just to interested um, public representatives later in June to give, give them this same kind of presentation and um, on, on biodiversity and biodiversity loss. Uh, because we have to remind ourselves, like we vote for our public representatives and they will do what we ask them to do. So if as people, that's what we want them to do, we have to tell them and, and therefore, you know, email your local reps, ask them when they knock at your door, tell them that this is an important issue. Um, and it will, there is things happening. I don't want people to get despondent. And uh, it's just slow, but sometimes slow and steady wins the race. Um, Mark, you, you said uh, uh, before in a conversation that, you know, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And this is all something we have to do collectively. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, Catherine, we're, we're just coming up on, on time. Uh, any final questions that you'd like to? No, I suppose just the final um the thread coming through is the need for education and inspiration. If we don't know, we can't look after it. Yeah. So, yeah, we're all in agreement on that. And, and that's where, you know, my boys aren't in school yet, but they know names of things. I, actually, three Gaelga from my dad. Um, so it's just that awareness of the environment. And actually, and I'm saying what I preach because I went to the crash yesterday to talk about biodiversity and peace. <laughs> and, and, you know, and they're the kind of things that we need to do. Um, to keep to make sure that the next generation know and uh, respect the value around them of, of nature um, and also do you know there's even research to say that if you tune into those documentaries those kind of Richard, Richard Attenborough ones it actually makes you more, more respectful for nature so even if you're you're housebound you can still play your part um, by just you know talking about the value of nature and I think making sure that our public representatives know how much we value it is really important. Okay, on that note, uh, Evine, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and uh, and and thank you for all of your work in relation to the the citizens' assembly. Uh, it, it's very clear that uh, the the outcomes. I I I think uh, I'm very confident that there will be uh, good traction on this, and uh, we in Chagask are very happy to work with you and and the the various uh, change makers to 
to to uh, get get some of these recommendations over the line so uh thank you again and Catherine thanks so much for helping with questions and thanks everybody for the really excellent questions this morning and uh, my thanks to Yvonne Maher and to Michelle Lavelle uh, in assisting with this morning's uh, production and to Andy Boland and uh, Pat Murphy in our wider production team so until next week uh, have a good weekend and enjoy the fine weather thanks again thanks very much thank you bye-bye bye-bye